past year, it has been a year of just tons of disruption. And that disruption is still swirling around us in a ton of different ways. So we're going to focus on another big and I think hidden disruptor that is coming out there for us. And that is a new accounting standard, the leasing standard. Now this standard has to be adopted for annual reporting periods for private companies beginning after December 15th, 2021. We had a slight delay. And then for entities that are subject to GASB fiscal years beginning after June 15th, 2021. And then for all reporting periods thereafter. Luckily, we have learned a lot of painful lessons from some of our public company friends that have gone before us and weathered the storm. So I have some special guests that are joining me today. First, I've got Walker Wilkerson. He's one of our national assurance leaders, and he's author of a new article that is just really hot right now on LinkedIn called Coffee and Embedded Leases. So welcome, Walker. Glad to be here. Thanks, Leslie. We also have Joy Fisher in our cast team, and she has just been in the heat of the battle helping companies with the adoption and has a lot of great perspectives on what I will call lessons learned. So Joy, great to have you today too. Thanks, Leslie. Good to see you. Finally, we've got Jen Rowan. And of course, we're still getting a ton of questions on employee retention credits. A lot of people very interested in that. So she's going to be answering those questions today that you might have. Now, before we dive in today, I do have some housekeeping that I want to cover. So as always, we have the ability for live Q&A during our session. And in order to participate, you can log in and use that link below me. You can like and those questions are going to move up in priority so that others can see those. They can help get those addressed too. And we have several moderators who are in that chat ready to engage and interact with you. I also want to let you know that we have another big disruptor that's happening in the industry. We've talked about it the last couple weeks, the restaurant revitalization fund. That is a mouthful, right? And so we have a webinar that is coming up on April 28th with Karen Blasick on that, talking about eligibility and the application process. So you can register for that on our website. And finally, in addition to the webinars and the articles, contact your CLA professional because we absolutely want to talk to you and interact with you. So with that, let's start with Walker and Joy. And guys, when I talked about the introduction to this session, I talked about the fact that we've got both a financial accounting standards board and a governmental accounting standards board lease standard and just the fact that it's going to have impact on financial reporting, but maybe you can give just a quick overview about what that impact is going to be. Sure, I just wish I had a PowerPoint presentation to take up the full hour, but we'll try to keep this at 35,000 feet. So let's start off with the similarities. Both of the accounting standard boards are, are basically going to require you to put your operating leases onto your balance sheet. You're gonna have a leased asset, you're gonna have a leased obligation. Now, between the two standard setters, that's about the end of the similarities. Now we start to, to show it a little differently once we get on the income statement, of course, also on the cash flow statement. Within sight of the realm of FASB, we have it broken down into two categories. We've got operating and financing. Now, financing, if you're familiar with capital leases, that's basically what it is. And so those will still be treated the same. The operating leases, though, they'll be treated a little bit differently. Moving over to the GASB side, if you have governmental type activities like your general funds, special revenues, or others, it's gonna look a lot different. And this is super important to understand because the way that those expenses are gonna show is going to change the way you budget. So where last year you were able to put your, your budget together showing all of your operating expenses for your operating leases as a functional category, now for the year of inception of the lease, you're going to have capital outlays for the full amount. So if you didn't budget for that, you just budgeted for the payments, you're going to have much less expenditures budgeted than what you're going to actually report. Conversely, you're going to have uh, other financing sources. So there's some big impacts on, on the GASB side, but flipping back over to FASB, why do you need to pay attention to it today? Well, 
you're going to have a new liability on your books, a new financial obligation that's typically like long-term debt, right? Okay, what are your current debt covenants look like? Is this going to impact them? The answer is yes, it is. But you need to understand how it's going to impact them. And it might even make you make some different decisions along the way. So when you talk just at a 35,000 foot view, as you said, Walker, I mean, it sounds fairly simple. I mean, certainly there's some geographical things on the balance sheet, but I think a lot of people sit there and they go, well, it doesn't seem so bad, does it? So Leslie, while Walker's overview doesn't sound too bad, I completely agree with you. What we're finding in helping our clients and implementing this new standard is it's not that simple in practice. And CLA actually has a five-phased approach that we're using to assist our clients in adopting the new LISA standard. And in that, we're finding there's a couple of these phases that are really find clients are really finding that it's consistently taking them more and more time than they expect to implement. Um, the first one being identifying the population of contracts to be reviewed. I was one of the first ones to say, gosh, that sounds so simple. Um, and most entities do have their arms wrapped around what are their known leases, right? Um, because they're already aware of those. But it's not just about buildings and automobiles. Um, companies often miss equipment leases that may historically have flown under the radar or lease contracts that are decent a lot of service contracts out there that many of which actually rely on underlying assets and those oftentimes are actually lease arrangements embedded in those service contracts so reading through those service contracts to look for and document those embedded leases is quite time consuming as well um, and when conducting that embedded lease analysis what our clients are finding is they are often surprised as to what types of arrangements actually contain leases that they didn't previously think of. So I would love to say that it's simple on the surface, but when we get into practice, we are finding some nuances that management teams really do need to be on the lookout for. So I think that that's kind of an interesting overview because you started to unpack what's a little bit of a can of worms. And you mentioned this concept of embedded leases and Walker, you even have this article called Coffee and Embedded Leases, which at first I thought was this nice little event that people could go to, but it really turned out to be this disgusting concept when I got into it and read it. So why don't you give us some examples of what embedded leases are? Yeah, and, and you know, you're right. That's a great thing. Everybody has, uh, you know, the experience with a coffee service, right? And so as part of the coffee service, though, what we don't think about is that we get a machine and whenever we get that coffee machine and it's sitting in our break room, we have control over that asset. Now, you don't really have to worry about capitalizing that underneath of the lease standard, but it's something that usually resonates with everybody whenever we throw that example out there. And, and I know that Joy's got some great examples of some practical applications that she's had as well. Absolutely. Only the leasing standard can make us rethink is coffee really as wonderful as we always thought it was, right? right. Um, but we've also found some of our other loves, if you will. Um, we've uh, had clients, convenience store clients, for example, that have service contracts with our favorite food and beverage vendors. Maybe it's Coca-Cola or Pepsi or that favorite ice cream vendor that supplies beverages and frozen treats in their stores. Well, we go in there as consumers and think about how wonderful it is, but those frozen treats and beverages are also sitting in those refrigerated units. In many cases, those contracts might actually be supply type contracts, but then include embedded leases for that refrigerated unit itself that the company never previously thought of. And similar to some other service type contracts, a number of uh, entities out there maybe have parking lot or facility management type services where you hire a management company um, to help manage your parking facilities on a multi-year service contract. Well, guess what? If there's any of that parking management equipment that's out there, that could be an underlying asset in these service contracts that might actually meet the definition of a lease. You've got the equipment, you've got payment amounts, it's included in your payment to the company, and many of those, Walker, do constitute embedded leases. You know, and that's one of the things that, that I have found really interesting. I don't know if I have had a conversation with a, a client to talk about leases yet, where, you know, we always start off and they're always, I know what my copier leases are. And so they come to us and, 
and they tell us, all right, and a, and a practical example that we had that's in my mind is, had somebody come to us, so I've got 57 leases. These are my automobiles. These are my copy machines. These are my facilities. I'm good. And, and so we're like, okay, fantastic. Now, this is a, a lottery authority. And so I shared with them the example of the, of the copy service. And they're going, okay, wait a minute. Now you're asking me that I got I to gotta go out and look at service contracts too. And so they're going, wow, I got to figure out how I got to gather those. So they've already got the 57 that they knew about. They read them. And now they're going, I have to go back out and read my service contract. I probably have another <clears> hundred <throat> of those. So just realizing that is already starting to, to make them think, wow, this is a lot more time than I thought. But then after the example, they're going, oh, wait a minute, I, I have a universal contract to put these lottery terminals in all of the retail outlets that are out there. And they're going, could that be an embedded lease? And the answer is yes. So they went from 57 to thousands of leases. And it wasn't but a short time later that I'm having another conversation with a private company, an equity company who owns a bunch of gas stations. And guess what's inside of all those gas stations? Lottery machines. So it's just amazing where you can find these embedded leases. But even more so, it's really eye-opening for them to understand that they not only are going to have to look at the contract that say lease on it, but they're going to have to look at the service contracts to find those embedded opportunities as well. So, you know, I think that Joy isn't being super joyful because she's creating a lot of work here for all of our clients <laughs> here. But, you know, let's talk about if there's any upside to all of this as you guys have been helping people with implementation of this. I think that Joy and Walker, you certainly actually have found some joyful stories or some silver linings to this. And so I'd love to hear what those are. Absolutely, Leslie, that's a great point. We do have a number of clients that kind of have that aha moment of, oh, I didn't realize this was going to take this much time to implement, or, oh, I was hoping I could use an Excel spreadsheet, and now I'm finding it's way too much work, and I'm going to need a software solution. But we are finding companies, a number of our clients that are having wins as well. The upside is our clients we're finding are identifying all types of waste and inefficiencies in their current processes of how things are currently working, and they are now utilizing this knowledge to help them um, operate a more profitable business. Going through this exercise, um, you know, has helped our clients identify duplications of purchasing, um, overlapping of multiple vendors that are, you know, providing the same types of services for companies at, at an inefficient rate, and a number of them that simply didn't realize how decentralized their processes were, especially if they had decision-making power across multiple locations, right? And all of those were costing companies and our clients more than they realized. Um, there's some of them from that have real estate leases that have maybe realized that, hey, over time, my CAM expenses have been going up and maybe even more than what was allowed in the lease contract, but no one was ever looking at it or scrutinizing it. And so now our clients are actually utilizing this to say, okay, in our negotiations, we need to be going back to our, our, uh, our third parties and making sure that we're looking at these things. Leslie, perhaps my favorite um, um, success story, if you will, for a perk that a client really enjoyed is um, this one still amazes me. We were assisting a healthcare client um, with their implementation of ASC 842, and the client had grown over the years through acquisition and consolidation. So as you can imagine, they had a lot of decentralized processes. And they were totally shocked as we went through this process. They learned they had three different copier vendors and throughout the organization, they ended up counting or, or we assisted them in finding over a thousand copiers in this one healthcare uh, institution. And when we did the numbers, they were absolutely shocked to see that they were spending over $35 million a year on copier expense. That could insane. you imagine? So talk about knowledge being power, right? When you start thinking about your lease versus buy decisions, your streamlining of your vendors, um, there's so much that they're learning, okay. And you can imagine they move forward immediately and saying, all right, we need to go visit this, for, revisit this from the business standpoint because we're losing too much money here with copiers. Yeah, that is a really good point. 
So you guys have covered, I think, a lot of ground just in terms of, you know, there's debt covenants that are going to change. Certainly, there's a lot of time and complexity. And then, you know, certainly potential benefits, too, where people could save money. So they need to start, I think, sooner. How can CLA help with implementation? Because it does sound complicated. Yeah, and, and at the end of the day, you know, we were kind of making a light of it earlier, <laughs> but it really is complicated. And the biggest part is having a solid plan. It all starts with that. If you try to do this haphazardly, it's just you're not going to be successful. And you got to have a time frame that's realistic. And the only way to do that is to come up with a solid plan. And that's the first way that we can help. You know, Joy mentioned that, that we have a five-phase plan that we use to approach implementing the lease standard with our clients. And so, if nothing else, you know, I always say everything starts with that conversation. And so we need to at least engage and have a conversation about how much time this realistically takes and how far our, our folks understand, you know, you've got to be able to identify that whole population. How do you do that? Just getting your arms around what you have. You know, everybody wants to jump to the end and say, well, I can tell you how much time it's going to take. Tell me how many leases you have. Nobody can tell you that until after they've done that evaluation. So that's the first part. And let's say that we've got the plan. The second part is having that that enterprise software solution out there, the thing that's going to work for you. And if it's, you know, if you need that management feature, you don't just need the accounting, but you also want to be able to manage and understand those leases. You know, there's uh, there's a different product from just the pure computation. And, and Joy, I know that you have a passion for assisting people with software selection, right? Oh, absolutely. That's one no of the strong no, opinions, right? <laughs> no strong opinions at all. We have had so many clients that perhaps underestimate the importance of due diligence, assessing what, what really are their needs. It, what's the nature of their lease portfolio to figure out what software solution will, will work the best for them? Um, do they have potential options within their ERP solution or should they be looking outside of that? So CLA does uh, come alongside of our clients and help them ask the right questions, consider the right things so that as they're going through there, that process, they can help determine, all right, what really is the best solution that's customized to fit their needs the best? Well, that's great. You guys have done a really great job just giving an overview of this, and we really appreciate your insights. We're going to keep you guys around because I think there are definitely questions that we're getting from our viewers, and we'll bring you back at the end. With that, I do want to pivot over to Jen because, Jen, we are just getting all kinds of questions on the retention credit, and I think it's timely to bring you in for that. So, Jen, I want to start actually, though, with one on gross receipts, if you wouldn't mind. So, People have all kinds of questions, I think, about gross receipts, accounting methods, aggregation, affiliation, and certainly it's important because a lot of times that's the starting point, right, for whether or not we qualify. I think we're getting a lot of questions when you talk about the gross receipts test, particularly as it relates to qualifying it using prior quarters. And so I think if you can just give us some background and overview there, that would be so helpful if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much for having me back. It's always fun when I get to do this with you and Walker enjoys such great content. So um, what, I'd like to, what I'd like to do is just talk to the group. First of all, let's remember what the gross receipts test is, right? So we aggregate all entities to the extent that we have greater than 50% common ownership. And then we take a look at our gross receipts in the current quarter compared to the same quarter in 2019. So in 2020, let's say if we qualify, it's a it's a greater than 50% reduction of reduction gross receipts compared to the same quarter in 2019. And then you get it for every quarter thereafter until you bounce up over 80% of where you were in 2019. Now in 2021, the gross receipts test is you have to be less than 80% of where you were in the same quarter in 2019. So that's at least what it is. And then what we do is we have the ability to either look at our current quarter or what we can do is look at the prior quarter, if that makes sense. So in Q1 of 21, I could actually look at Q4 of 20, compare that to Q4 of 19. And if I was at less than 80%, then I could take it. Not only then would I be able, well, that would just qualify me right in Q1. 
Now people are saying, all right, so if I qualify in Q1, do I automatically qualify in Q2, right? Like that's the big question. And the answer is if you have that 20% or greater than 20% reduction in gross receipts in Q1 of 21, then yes, you'll automatically qualify in Q2 based on Q1. That does not then qualify you for the rest of the year. So that's something to keep in mind. And I think that's confusing for people because it's like, well, do I automatically qualify? Well, no, if you qualified in Q1 because of the Q4 reduction, you're not then entitled to subsequent quarters. It's just the prior quarter. And then somebody else in the chat was asking the very wise question of, so can I flip back and forth? You know, does two equal four? Essentially, if I qualify in yep. Q1, can I then use Q2 to reflect back? And then do I qualify again in Q3? As of right now, that's the answer is yes. You know, will it stay that way? We don't know, right? Because yep. we've only got the two notices. But as of right now, yeah, two equals four. So you really can. If you qualify in Q1, you'll automatically qualify in Q2. If you do some clever planning, you could qualify in Q3, and that would automatically qualify you in Q4. Again, yep. that's as of April 22nd. <laughs> yeah, and your point more to be seen as we get more guidance, right? Yes. Do you mind if I also ask you a question and throw a curveball at you on the Families First Act? Oh my gosh, I love the curveballs. <laughs> All right. Have it. Perfect. <laughs> well, you know, I know that we're getting a lot of questions on that. So, you know, there are provisions there that talk about the fact that, you know, there's 80 hour limits for qualified sick leave wages in 2021. And so what would happen if you took that sick leave in 2020? And then do you start over again in 2021? And how does all of that work? Yeah, so that is actually a fantastic question. And it was one to which we did not have an answer initially, right? So Families First, if you recall, was that very first bit of legislation that required employers with fewer than 500 employees to pay that first two weeks that you mentioned. And then the than the 10 subsequent weeks if they were staying home to care for a young child. The obligation ended to pay at the end of 2020, but the credit itself did not. Consolidated Appropriations Act extended that credit into the first quarter of 2021. So then everybody said, well, did that mean the clock reset? To your, to your point, you know, if I paid the leave in 2020 and now somebody's taking it again in 2021, did the clock reset? American Rescue Plan answered that question and what, what it did was it extended the availability of the credit in Q2 and Q3, but then it also reset the clock starting April 1st of this year. So you were eligible to claim the credit if you paid the wages from March 13th, I believe it was, through, through the end of 2020, because you were obligated to do so. It's still the same period or the same term that you're accruing for each employee as far as taking the credit goes through the end of Q1. But now that we're in Q2 and Q2 and Q3, it again doesn't reset the obligation to pay, but it does reset the credit um, and also enhances the credit, interestingly enough, um, to $12,000 max as opposed to the $10,000 max. It's interesting not to carry on here, but like Biden and his announcement yesterday saying, look, employers are going to be expected to pay the leave for employees to go get the vaccination and then to recover from the vaccination. Um, the intention of this resetting of the clock is it coincides with that, that announcement. So employers actually, to the extent that you'll be required to pay that leave, will also be entitled to a credit for having paid that leave, which is nice. And remember that family's first credit is a dollar for dollar payroll tax credit that you would claim on your Form 941. Well, thank you. Those are such awesome insights on those payroll matters. We do have a couple lease questions, so I do wanna bring in our leasing experts to cover those. All right, so for the leasing experts here, we do have a question. What is the best guidance to find information on about how to set up an office lease under the new standards that also has rent abatement over the first two months that starts this month? So I don't know which one of you wants to arm wrestle and take that one. I can always share that, you know, you can always come to our website and look for the lease articles that we have. That, that's always got some great information. In addition to that, I really find going to the standard is the right place to go. That has every answer that you could possibly have. 
Um, we, we always talking about some of the white papers that are out there because it'll take longer to read the white paper than it will take to actually look at the standard. And so always start with the standard. It's going to always give you the right answer, not an interpretation of some, what somebody thinks might be the right answer. Man, it's like when people don't want to go to the tax code either, Walker, and I always get them to go I, there first. I, I know. Get it. <laughs> go straight to the source. <laughs> or, you know, right. hey, the other thing, you can always give me a call as well, and I'm more than happy to, to look through. I, and, and I always talk to people for flipped answers, because if you haven't read that contract, you're going to miss something that's important. I don't know how many times people have said, you know, Walker, I've got this circumstance. How is it treated? And I'm like, oh, well, generally like this. And, and then they're like, hey, so, well, you know, here it is. And I start reading through it and I'm like, well, you didn't tell me about this clause. <laughs> yeah. So the devil is always in the details. That's devil another the great detail. point. Yeah. So we have another question. And Joy, you can answer this since you actually corrected me on this as we were preparing for this. And that is, when does the leasing standard go into effect? Yes. So in 2020, the standard setters did put, push it off again for us. And so for private companies, it's going to be for uh, annual periods that begin after December 15th, 2021. And then for any of our folks out there who follow uh, GASB, it will be after June of, of, of 2021 for them. So we've got a little bit of time, but it's important to go ahead and act now. Great. Yep. Good point. All right, Walker. Another question we have is that we've got a lot of people who have single member LLCs or all these LLCs that are owned, you know, with their operating company. Are those going to be subject to the leasing standard? Yeah, that's the question that's on everybody's minds. What are we going to do about all of these related party transactions? And, and as a profession, we're still working through some of those questions to be able to come up with the answer. And we're looking for some additional guidance. But we've got a pretty good feel right now. And, and as you said, the word devil's in the details. And you really need to see if there's a contract that's even in existence. And if it is, what does it say in order to come up with the right answer? Yeah, that's really good advice. I suppose it does hinge on what that darn language says. <laughs> <laughs> if they even have any, they may just fall under their own state law if they don't have an agreement. That's one of the other fun things. And, and you know, this not to jump over into estate planning, but that was one of my favorite concepts is that if you don't have a will, yes, you do, but you're not going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> Great point. All right, we have another great question. That is, do we have a toolkit in Excel to exist with lease accounting implementation standards? And you guys probably have a lot of thoughts on two ki toolkits and Excel and all sorts of comments yeah, on that. We, <laughs> we certainly do. There's no question about that. And um, you know, the answer is, yeah, there's some toolkits that are out there. We do not have a Excel toolkit on our website that you can go and get and use. Why? Because Excel is prone to error. We don't want to give you something that could potentially return a wrong solution. And so we do have some ways that we can help, though. Um, you know, as Joy mentioned, we can walk alongside of you to find the right solution for you, the enterprise solution that you know is going to be correct and that you can't go in, manipulate cells and, and come up with the wrong answer. But if you don't want to go through all of those hoops, don't want to lose, uh, learn a new lease software, we can help with that, too, because, of course, we have one. And if you want to go through and do all of the legwork or have us walk alongside of you to help do the legwork to create, um, you know, what we refer to as our import template, then we can take that information. We can put it into our system. We can give you back a roll forward lease asset schedule that has both the asset and the liability on it. We can propose journal entries for you. And as a byproduct, we can also create the draft footnote disclosure as well. Well, that's pretty snappy, Walker. That's very cool. <laughs> I love it. Well, I think that this was a really good overview. Appreciate the insights from everybody. Amazingly, that is all the time we have for today. Time flies when you have as much fun as we do. So I want to thank all of you guys for your insights. I want to thank our moderators who have been live with us for your engagements and questions. Please register and engage with us. We absolutely love having you be part of the conversation with us. We will see you next week. But until then, please stay safe and healthy and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.